Now it's time to create a basic maze game. First thing I'll do is do a save as with my new project and call it maze game one. If you're online, you can just select untitled project and type maze game one there. So we want to use the cat, but it will be easier to navigate the maze if we just use the cat's head, which is shaped a bit more like the classic Pac-Man head. So the first thing to instruct the students to do is to delete the cat's body. To do that, they'll have to go to the Costumes tab. Notice we're in vector mode with all the tools on the right. Vector mode means if I zoom all the way in, my graphics will still stay nice, stay nice and sharp. Also, vector mode enables users to group a bunch of different shapes together. So watch, with the select tool, I'm going to click once on the cat. If I click and drag, all the parts of the cat will move together. Undo that. So if I was to click on the head and click delete, all those other parts that are grouped would be deleted too. Don't want to do that, so undo. What I'll need to do to delete the cat's body is select the cat once by clicking, and then notice a new button appear called ungroup. So I'll click that. Now we have separate body parts. So I can click on each leg and delete them. Great. I can also delete the other costume for now because I don't want to ever show the cat's body in the maze game. So I'll just have one costume. And instead of calling it Sprite 1, why don't we check the Info button here by clicking, and I'm going to change that to Cat. Or, what might be good is to call it Player, since this is the sprite that the player is going to control. Next, the student should add the code blocks to enable the player to move the cat with up, down, left, and right arrow keys. They've already learned that, so that's not a challenge, that's just something they need to do for their game. And a great way to review. Which category was that when key press block in, do you remember? Events. Events start or trigger a script in Scratch. So I'm going to say when key pressed, but not the space key, I want to start with up arrow. When up arrow key pressed, I want to point up and then move 10 steps. You can test it right away, moving up. If I shift click, I can choose duplicate and duplicate that entire script for down arrow key. Down arrow, down. Now if students were already using the change x, change y, blocks in their previous, it's totally okay for them to use it here. Often more than one way to program, this is just one method. And again, they're do they should be doing this on their own, so I'm just showing you the quick way that I would do it here. Then we can say, let's duplicate again, shift click, left arrow, and shift click, right arrow. So left and right. Or if they wanted to do, they could say change x by negative 10 for left arrow and change x by positive 10 for right arrow. But there's going to be a problem. Down looks fine, right looks fine, up looks fine, but left we have that upside down problem again. Which block did you learn would prevent it from flipping the graphic upside down? Setting rotation style. Since the problem happens when the player moves left, could put that set rotation style right inside when left arrow key pressed. Now I can go up, down, left, right. Cool. If the student still wants the cat to be facing up, right, and left, in other words, instead of moving up with the cat facing right, they could put another set rotation style in each of the arrow keys. So it'd be set rotation, rotation style all around 
inside these. So if I go down, but I want the cat to actually look down, I can put set rotation style all around. And that works until I go left again. I'm not so concerned about that personally. Just wanted to make sure you knew how to do it in case there was a student that was frustrated. Cat moves in all four directions. The next task is to draw a maze. So to draw a maze on the background, I need to select the stage. See, that gives me a backdrops tab that works just like the costumes tab in a sprite. Backdrops tab lets me paint the background. I'm going to zoom out so I can see the entire stage to make it easier to design. I like to choose a dark color for my maze walls. I'll go for a dark blue. And see how thin the line is by default? I find it helpful to increase the thickness of the line. So I'm going to go to about midway there. Now when I click and drag, I've got a nice thick line for my maze. So there's several different ways to do the maze. We're going to let the students discover on their own. I just want to point out we're in bitmap mode by default. Different. See, now the tools are on the left versus the right. You'll be seeing the difference when we create the second level in the maze game using those vector tools. So for now, if you want to do a simple maze using the paintbrush, could create an outline. and then draw in walls. I don't have to be too careful about how much space is there for the cat's head because I can resize the cat's head. In fact, it's going to be a good idea to make the cat's head smaller. How's that for a simple maze? Totally simple, right? Now, if you want your lines to be straighter, the easy way to do that is I'm going to clear my backdrop and instead of using the paintbrush tool I'll use the line tool. So the line to the lines will be the same thickness but now I get a nice straight line. Notice it's at an angle. If you want the line to be parallel to the top or bottom of the stage click the shift key and hold it as you're dragging. So I'm holding the shift key and dragging to get a nice parallel line. Do the same thing on the right, holding the shift key will make it parallel to the left and right. And across the bottom and up and down. Okay, it's a little bit off, so I can do undo just to undo that one line. Try drawing from the top. That's that corner. Then I can do my simple line here simple line here and as I did before in the middle. One other quick way to draw mazes is to use the rectangle tool. Am I clear? So with the rectangle tool, if I click and drag, I'll draw a rectangle. If I hold the shift key it makes a perfect square, but in this case I don't want a perfect square. Like so. Now, I won't be able to draw again until I click outside of the square because Scratch thinks that I want to be able to move that rectangle after I draw it by clicking and dragging. So I can either click outside of the rectangle or click on another tool and that will deselect it. Now for the interior walls, I'm going to use the filled rectangle option. See, this is my hollow rectangle. If I click filled, then I can do sort of chunkier walls. And what I don't like about this is you can't set a precise thickness, so it's kind of hard to make them even. So with that in mind, I think I'm going to stick with the lines for now. Of course, you don't have to stick with straight lines. I'm just doing it for ease here. I've seen some really cool curved mazes or spirals. You can do that by using the oval tool. And 
and then just using erase really thick to create holes or doors, however you want to decide. Okay, back to the line tool. Although I did like how quick it was to use the rectangle for the border. So how about I do the border with a rectangle? Now what's nice is I can resize by clicking the corners, any of those control dots, the cor and the corners in the center. So I can resize it to go right to the edge of the stage if I want. Yeah, I like that. Then I'll use my lines. or inner walls. If you want to move a wall, you can use the select tool. Not so precise in bitmap mode, but for now, it's funny the cat's head is moving. I'm, I clicked and dragged to select, and then I'm using the arrow keys to precisely move. You could click and drag to move, but I like using the arrow keys to nudge just a little bit to either side. So now I have a basic maze. The problem with my maze is that if I move my cat it goes right through the walls. So challenge number one, prevent the cat from moving through walls. I bet you're gonna need to use some blocks for that. But where do the blocks go? Right now we're on the stage. The stage can have blocks. Although notice with the stage selected, I don't see any blocks under motion. That's because the stage can't move. You can't scroll a background. We're going to see how to do that in the next game, the scroller game. But for now, you won't be able to add any motion blocks. If you want the cat sprite to detect if it's touching a wall, you'll need to put those blocks on the cat. Now, students have already been dealing with detection for the ball and the cat in the previous game. So they have the basic skills that they need for being able to prevent a cat from moving through walls. But this requires them to think algorithmically, to think computationally. So thinking algorithmically or computationally just means breaking things down into individual steps. That's what the computer needs, instructions on the steps to accomplish something. So what are the actual steps? If I'm moving a cat up, when it gets to a wall, it needs to detect the wall is there. And it needs to not continue moving. So how do they do that? Well, we want to make sure they have time to try to figure it out on their own. So why don't you pause this video now and see if you could figure out a way to use the blocks you already know for detection what category did we have that detection in? Sensing. Remember, before you used touching edge or touching other sprite. But there is no other sprite. It's not the edge of the stage that we want, it's actually these walls. Notice the next block lets you detect color. So that would be a good block to try out. Pause, and I'll be here when you come back. Are you back? Did you figure it out? Well, whether you figured it out or not, let me show you what I think is the easiest way for the cat to detect walls and not pass through. The cat needs to detect the wall there and then stop. But you can't tell a cat to stop. You can't tell a sprite to stop. There is a stop block, but that stops scripts. And then you can't restart them easily. It's more complicated. So watch what we can do. For the cat, under scripts, I'm going to need to detect whether it's touching a wall, and I'll tell it to detect when green flag clicked. So the block I need is touching color. Now watch the way this works. I need to click inside the color block once, click, then I'm panning or moving my cursor over onto the color that I want to choose. Clicking once on the color to set that color in here. If I move it to the cat, see, different color. So I'm going to click, drag, and now I have my color. 
If the line is too thin, or if students click too close to the edge, they might get a color that's a blend between the blue and the background white color. So it would be a little bit off and it wouldn't work properly. Especially if they have really thin lines, if their code isn't working, you can do a test by having them try to draw one line a little bit thicker and see if their code works. So we want this touching color block to detect. But how do you check if it's actually touching? We need an if-then block. If touching blue. It's checking, is this sprite touching the color blue? But if we put that right after when green flag clicked, it's only going to check once at the very beginning, the first time you click the green flag. So we need another block. What's the block that lets us check something over and over and over again? Yes, forever. Do you remember what we call those types of block like forever and repeat? A loop. So forever, if touching color blue, then. Then what? What should the cat do if touching color blue? Well, what was the cat doing before it touched color blue? It was moving 10 steps. Move 10 steps. Move 10 steps. So couldn't you say, if touching color blue, move negative 10 steps? Negative 10. Let's test it. Now I will click the green flag to test it, because I need to click that flag for this forever script to run. So click the green flag. Move up. OK, it works moving up. Let's test it moving left. Left. Works moving left, right, moves. But what if I move up and left? Well, I'm having trouble. I can't actually go past there because of the size of my cat. So it looks like I should also set the size of the cat at this point. There are a few different ways to do it, like many things in Scratch. If you look in the looks category, we do have a block for change or set size. But it's not always easy to know exactly how big or how much you should change it by. So watch what I'll do. I'm going to move the cat into one of those maze corridors. Oops. Let's click stop. My poor cat. It wasn't supposed to go there. So in that corridor, I'm going to click the shrink button above the categories. This will allow me, I can click once at a time to set the size. And notice what it does to the block. It updates the block as I'm doing it. So it looks like probably 60 or 50% will give me plenty of room for navigating my maze. So I'm going to stick with 55% and put it when green flag click, set size 55. Now I can click the green flag and I should be able to go through my corridors. But if I try to go through a wall, I don't. Can I go through here? Nope. So this works pretty well. Might not work as well if the maze is a little bit more complicated. So if students have a method like this, where they just have one block checking if it's touching and then moving, they might find it works better if they put this if after each move 10 steps block. See? I can duplicate it, shift click duplicate, put it after move 10 steps. This ensures that each and every time it moves, no matter what direction, it knows what direction to move backwards in. Fortunately for me, it works right here. But I did want to show you this also because it shows something a bit odd. Generally, you want to put an if-then statement inside a forever or repeat to keep checking but each of these when key pressed blocks also works as a loop. It means if I'm holding the down arrow key, all those blocks will keep running as long as the down arrow key is pressed, as if they had a forever block. So you don't have to use a forever block with a when arrow key pressed. So I'm going to remove that for now because mine is working just great. That means I have finished challenge number two. I can move but not go through my walls.
Ready for challenge number two? Make the cat's mouth open and close. One of the things I liked about Pac-Man was it really looked like the Pac-Man head was eating each of the dots as it was moving around the maze. So how would we make the cat's mouth open and close as the player is playing the game? Pause the video, try out some things, or don't pause and stay with me right now. Let me show you the easiest way to do this. I'm going to make sure I have the cat's head selected and go to costumes. I'll zoom in to make it easier to see my cat, also easier to select the different objects. I'm going to click once on the cat. Now I could redraw the mouth, but another nice thing about vector mode is this reshape tool. Watch, if I click the reshape tool once and then click on the mouth, see those little dots that appear? What if I zoom in and see them a little bit better? Those dots are called control points. I can click on a control point and drag to change the shape. Close the mouth. But why shouldn't I do it yet? Because I want to use two different costumes to alternate between open mouth and closed mouth. So I will undo, duplicate the costume the same way I duplicated code blocks. Hold the shift key, click duplicate. You might find you can use the right click or control or apple key, but those can be a little bit inconsistent. So I like instructing students to use the shift key because it works consistently whether you're offline, online, or in any operating system or browser. So with shift click, now I have a duplicate of that first costume. Use the reshape, click the mouth, move that control point. Now I have an open costume and a closed open, closed. But if I play my game, the costume will just be whichever one I have selected in the costume tab. I need to use code to alternate the costumes between open and closed. So in scripts, the easiest way to do this, in the looks category you see a number of blocks that have to do with costumes. Because there are only two costumes, we could just say next costume. And I could put it right inside that forever loop. Forever, next costume. But look how fast it's going. Super, super fast. If I go full screen by clicking the top left corner. So that's faster than I want. What I could do is put a wait block in there. But that's going to cause a problem with my detection for the walls. Watch. With that weight block, now I can pass through the walls. Why? Look at the code. Not only is the next costume waiting, but it's also waiting before it runs the if-then again. So it's only checking if touching color after each second passes. There are these gaps of a second in between. Fortunately, Scratch lets me run several scripts at the same time. So if I grab another when green flag clicked, next costume, and then put a forever block, I'll click the green flag again so both scripts run. Now I cannot pass through my wall. and it's waiting one second. It's a little bit long, so I'm going to try changing it to 0.25 seconds. That's better. I think I like 0.125. Now, I have a cat head that does not pass through walls, and a mouth that opens and closes just like Pac-Man. Cool. Click Stop. Challenge number three is to allow the cat to win the game when it reaches a prize. That's the challenge I give to the students. They have to break it down. What do we need to do? Well, first we need a prize. So they can either draw one or go into the sprites and select one. Since it's right here, I'm just going to grab an apple. So when the cat gets to the apple, There should be something that indicates that they've won the game. 
I'm going to resize the apple by using the shrink tool again. The player needs to detect when it's touching. Couldn't we use the same block that we used in the cat ball game? In other words, in sensing, touching apple. But where should the code go? Well, again, algorithmic thinking. What are the steps? What do I want to have happen? What's the code doing? Well, the cat is going to touch the apple, but if I want the apple to disappear, like it would when you reach a prize, then the apple is the thing that's going to respond, not the cat. So I want to put the code on the apple, plus I already have a bunch of code on the cat, and no code on the apple, so it's just nice and neat. So we want when touching player, remember I named that player sprite for the cat? When touching player, the apple should do something. Let me show you the easiest way to meet this challenge. When green flag clicked, of course we want to check forever if the apple is touching the player. Then what do you want the apple to do once it's touching the player sprite or the cat? Well, we can tell the apple to hide. Let me test that. Fly, move my cat down, boop, it hides. Cool. There's a problem. If I click the green flag again, the apple doesn't appear, and the cat would be overlapping the apple. So it means it would touch it, and even if the apple was showing, it would immediately disappear. So we want to set a starting position for the cat, and we want to make sure that at the beginning of the game, the apple is shown. So while on the Apple Scripts tab, drag a show block in. When green flag clicked, show. But watch, I'm going to click the green flag. And it doesn't show because it's touching the player right away. So then let's go to player. And I want to show you one of my favorite tricks in Scratch. Before I drag a go to XY, which lets me set a starting position for the cat, Right now it says go to 190, negative 21, that's where the cat is, but watch. I'm going to drag the cat to where I want it to start, and then it updates the go to block. So now if I drag the go to block in, it has the starting position. I can click the green flag, go, click the green flag again, cat will always start back at the beginning. To test the code, here's a great shortcut especially if you've got a complicated maze, it means every time you tweak the code you need to navigate your maze and then go over. Watch what you can do though. If I, I can just click and drag the cat to be close to there to save myself some time. Click again, green flag, and it starts. But the challenge was to allow the cat to win the game when it reaches a prize, so we also need some kind of message to tell the player that they've won. Easy way to do that on the Apple scripts, look under looks. We can say or think. So you could have the Apple say, if touching player, then say, you win. Let's try it. Drag my cat over there to save some time. Oh no doesn't show me because we're hiding the apple. <coughs> Excuse me, so if the apple is hidden, that means the message from the apple is also hidden. Could we have some other way to display you win on the screen? Well, what if we put a wait in there? What if we say you win and wait before hiding the apple? Go to here. You win. I can make it more elegant having fewer blocks by using say for. Say for lets you specify how long the message displays. So I can say you win for two seconds and then hide. Now if I navigate, you win and it hides. But the cat is still 
moving around. We still got that mouth. So let's add one more block. Remember I said there was a block for ending things? Stop. So once it's hidden, you could say stop all, including the cat. So I can move my cat over, go to here. You win. Stops. And then they can play again. Pretty cool. That was challenge number three.